my background, you know, at the moment, heavily involved with Bonterra as a director, ANSCO, which is one of the largest meat companies, as a director, and, I've, um, and I'm just scaling down my involvement with the deer industry um, after chairing that for seven or eight years. So, look, um, I just thought I'd outline the challenge that we face, and I've got it up there, to provide more nutrition from the same volume of food with a lower environmental footprint while being respectful to both human and animal rights. And I could actually add another one in there now under the latest legislation in vertebrate health actually overtops both of those as well. So that's, that sort of um, really um, summarises what we are going to have to do in the next decade. And, and if we are not going to produce more volume, you can go to the next slide please. Um, um, if, you, if we're not going to produce more food, we actually want to be paid more for it. Um, because the days of actually um, trying to monetise increasing volumes are gone. And you saw that with the kiwi fruit example. Although with kiwi fruit, of course, we do have more, we do have more volume. So <clears throat> my core view is that we are at peak meat production, peak, peak milk production in New Zealand or very close to it. Um, but I also believe that globally we're very close to that point as well. And what I'll do is I'll explain a little bit about why I think that's the case on the uh, next slide. But the challenge here is that, um, sorry, go, oh yeah, go forward, yep. Yeah. I'll go forward to it. Yeah, you go forward, yep. Yeah. Is that we've also reduced, we've committed to reducing our Diffuse pollution. Now, diffuse pollution is gases up and nitrogen down and phosphate across. That's probably the, the easy way to describe it. And, and societal expectations have changed a lot in terms of how we do that. So we're spending a lot of time now actually saying how we are we are we going to reduce our environmental footprint in the pastoral sector not forgetting that the horticultural sector, which has had a free pass in that regard to date, they're also going to have to deal with that as well. It's just that it hasn't had the same air time as, as, um, as the arable and, um, and pastoral sectors. So just moving on to the next one. Um, so the opportunity here is to extract more value, and that's, I suppose, my day job at the moment. How do we sell the same amount of volume for more money in the international park marketplace so we can feed it back to the producers because we know the producers have got some extra costs for meeting environmental constraints and so on. Um, the challenge is that the high end of the value chain at the moment is, is actually quite constrained by, um, by COVID. So there's a, there's a drive to value. So the, the luxury cuts of meat, the luxury products generally, have become much harder to sell in the last nine months. Now that's a short-term aberration, but we've just got to get through this next 12 months. And, and one of the key drivers to that is the US. US has become very difficult in the food service um, in the food service area. We're very lucky with most of our primary products in the uh, in the meat and milk sector, the pastoral sector, that China has been so strong and came out of COVID so fast. We do have a food a quality of distribution issue. Um, in other words, in today's world, you know there are more people that are challenged to be able to buy food, um, but there are more wealthy people as well. So we've got this distribution issue we're having to deal with. And so I get pretty frustrated when I hear people say out of New Zealand, oh, we're only going to sell to the wealthiest 50 million people in the world. Well, that's a load of bullshit because you don't produce everything in the luxury space. You know, you have to supply product, some of which is commodity, and some of which is luxury. And then, as a good example, I could give you skim milk powder at the moment. New Zealand's attracting a three to $400 a tonne premium for one of the largest commodities in the world. Quite hard to unbundle why we're getting three or $400 a tonne over and above the Europeans and Americans. But something to do with the word I'd call trust. They trust our supply chain, they trust us um, and they know that what they're getting. Um, so, so that global market, and if we just go to the next slide, I just thought I'd summarise it um, in, a, in, in this map. Now, don't focus on the detail too much, but effectively 
the dark colours are the parts of the world where people are really have got an affordability issue in terms of their ability to buy food and pay, pay us for it. And the light countries are the ones that don't have an affordability issue. But also, if you look at if you look at that map also, the area in Asia where the colours are dark um, and um, North Africa and the Middle East is where we've got free trade access. So there's a bit of an issue globally at the moment. The countries that can afford to pay a lot, there's no free trade access. And the countries that can afford to pay less, um, there is a greater degree of free trade access. The sweet spots for, our, for us there is North and Southeast Asia. And that's why we're concentrating so much on that market. It wouldn't matter if the Americans paid us 10 times the price for milk right now, we couldn't sell it to them. Right, next slide. So, if you, if you conclude that, you'd say, effectively, a cap exists on productivity in the foreseeable future, and the exporters' challenge is how we premiumise New Zealand. And so many consumers, on the other hand, are trading down because of affordability. And we've also got this heightened sense of awareness and, and urgency around solving environmental and social challenges. So you put all that together, and it's actually quite a complex beast. Um, but if you don't recognise the complexity of what you're dealing with, you can't actually address it and do something about it. Next one. So I just wanted to go back to basics for a second because being in New Zealand, when we think about animals, we think about animals grazing grass. Now we are actually, globally, we are actually quite unique. That's our, our gig isn't the same gig. 95% of the world's meat and milk is produced off grain. And it's in what we call feedlot type systems where they're on a pad or in a shed and being fed. And the global plant protein supply chain is strongly dependent on, on soybeans, and those soybeans are in a monoculture which is strongly dependent on, on um, glyphosate um, cropping every second year, um, and, and is actually, in my view, quite vulnerable because it, it is a monoculture. And so the answer lies, to my view, and so how do we think about plant protein and animal protein all together? The answer lies in actually integrated farm systems, which New Zealand is probably the global leader in. There's lots of things we aren't a global leader in, but that is the thing we are good at. Um, so, so the other thing is, and perhaps I'll just skip on to the next slide, the map, and I'll just show you this map because I, I think it's worthwhile concentrating on. Um, um, if you, don't worry about the detail again. Just look at two things I, I want to focus on. One is, where are the red bits? The red bits is where climate change is having an outsized effect. So relative to 1890, the temperature change is more than 10 degrees between 1890 and 2050. So say 150 years, about a 10 degree change. Those red bits is the grain belt, the global grain belt. That's where our grain comes from. For my perspective under a global climate change scenario, the global grain supply and therefore the price of grain is going to get really challenged. And guess what? If people can eat it directly rather than feed it through animals, they'll, put, they'll eat it first. The second thing, and if you look at, four, that's 40 degrees north, if you look at 44 degrees south, the only two bits of land you go through are the Patagonian Desert and um, the South Island of New Zealand. So we're on a you know, 44 degrees south, quite a unique climate, um, temperate climate, which makes New Zealand interesting. The second thing I just wanted to point out about that slide, if you look at where the world's most productive soils and also where the world's biggest populations are, they're on the deltas of the world. They're on the river mouths, which by definition are, are at sea level. They, because they're at the deltas, they've got the best soils in the world and the big populations. Think the Mekong, the Ganges, the Mississippi, um, you know, the, the Mass and the Wild in, in Holland. Think of all of those. Under a global climate change scenario, a lot of the areas where the fresh vegetables of the world and that intensive uh, horticulture is coming from are also going to be challenged. And not everybody can build dams like the, uh, um, like the Dutch. Next one. So that tells me that's just, I suppose, from my point of view, intuitively, it's a bit of a proof point 
that the world isn't just going to be able to produce another 30% more food to feed another 30% more population. But on top of that, we've got this new gig um, around carbon and that we are actually going to have to do all this and be carbon neutral and actually sink carbon. We actually need to do better with carbon than we're currently doing. So that just ups the, 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 um, the ante again and we are going to need a lot of technology to deliver on that. So GM technology, I think, will be one of the key, um, the, the key deliverers there. Personally, I'm not afraid of synthetic food um, because the secret to feeding the people that need to be fed with affordable nutrition and the luxury products at the other end is going to be componentisation. In other words, you'll have to eat, go to the next slide, thanks. Um, you'll, we, we'll be paid for it, we'll have to pay a premium for eating something whole. And so, when I talk about componentisation, it's not a new concept. If you buy infant milk formula, it's only 40% milk. Uh, it's got other things in it. If you go to North Africa, they buy a thing called fat-filled milk powder, which is the skim milk powder after the butter's taken out, or the cheese is taken out of it, and they add palm oil in, um, because palm oil's worth $600 a tonne, butter's worth $4,000 a tonne. So if you've got 30 cents or 20 cents a day to feed four children in the Congo, you're not interested in whether there's any orangutans in um, Indonesia have died or not you want to feed your children. So <clears throat> defining food as a medicine, and food is for nutrition, food for well-being, and food for pleasure is actually quite critical from our point of view. And we have products in New Zealand that fit all of those categories. And there is a whole new category called healthy functional food. And um, yeah, um, uh, deer velvet, um, uh, manuka honey, A2 milk. There's a range of things could broadly fit into that category. Next one, thanks. Um, um, so there are major implications, and I won't talk about these, but can under questions or over uh, you know, a drink later on if you want. There are big implications for processing, form and function, capital allocation, farm systems and system leakage, brand management, product positioning and infrastructure positioning and funding. And I'm spending a fair bit of time trying to think strategically about what are these implications, what do they actually mean for us um, into the future. We've got a lot of capital floating around, a lot of cash floating around now. If we spend it in the wrong place, it's not available for some of this. Okay? And then the final two slides, I just uh, wanted to dive into Canterbury and say, well, what, how does this look for Canterbury? Because that's the area where I spend a lot of my time and, and a lot of the guys and, girl, and girls here do as well. Well, the key thing, and I went to Canterbury in 1982, about the same time as Paul, um, in 1981, that we have, we do have the natural resources in Canterbury. We've got the soil and the water. Now, we were pretty inefficient users of it in the early days. You know, you, you make a few mistakes before you get it right. Um, but we have, when I say we've got human capital, we've got people there that know what to do and have learned and, and actually have a tolerance for risk and a tolerance for change. And one of the key things in all forms of production is that you have to have people that have got a mindset to be able to change and adapt. If you don't adapt, you die. And that's quite important. In Canterbury, our soils are lighter compared to, when I say lighter, a lower soil moisture holding capacity compared to a lot of the big productive soils in the world where they have deep clays with no organic matter content. We have high organic matter content, um, but a lower moisture holding capacity. What that means is it puts more pressure on the nitrogen part, nitrogen loss part of the component, and it's taken us 25 years to work out how not to lose nitrogen. No farmer in his right mind wants to lose nitrogen from the soil profile, because that's money down the drain, apart from anything else. And we all want to drink the water from our own wells. So we were getting pretty close to, um, well we did get to an agreement over the last 12 years with, in Canterbury for example, with all of the environmental stakeholders where we agreed that the World Health Organisation level for drinking water is 11.2 parts per million. We all agreed that 6.9 parts per million was the right number. That's what we target, about two thirds of the World Health Organisation um, recommended level. Now, just two weeks before the election, of course, we got a change, 
because that actually meant that we'd probably have to reduce our nitrogen limits by 36% by 2035. We've now got to reduce them, if we go to the next slide, by 75% because we've agreed that it's not 6.9, the government said 2.5. So we've just pushed the crossbar up um, more significant. And there's a lot of technology and science on the go that actually says we could get a long way there, but the last 25% of that is outside our current horizon. So if you say, what is 2.5, why 2.5? That's the level I've said invertebrate health, which are the little things you can't see in the water. Invertebrate health in the water is actually more, has a higher rating um, in terms of the law than human health and, um, and animal, animal welfare, i.e. drinking water. So that's our <coughs> current challenge. We have what we have. You've got a lot of people used to change actually walking towards it rather than burying our head in the sand. But I can't stand here today and say, we have this fixed. We've got a generation to get there. Um, but David Park is pretty adamant that this is where we're going and you guys will better get on board. So there's no point in, um, in being scared. We've just got to address it. Okay, and I think, uh, is that the uh, last, yeah, that's the last slide. Um, um, so, you know, look, what I really wanted to be able to um, conclude with there is, we are not out of the out of trouble in terms of our environmental standards that we need to do, but we know the pathway to success, but we've already come about 50% from where we started to where we are going. Thank you. Any questions for anyone further? Um, yeah. Chris. As a director of Fonterra, I don't think we can all agree it's great to see the portfolio rationalisation um, that you've been conducting. But what's the plan to, ex you know, and, and talk at the high level, obviously, um, the plan to extract the premium that we all know the product should get? Well, I think the first thing, Chris, is that the premium comes, there's this misconception that, you know, you only get premiums by selling the luxury yeah, no, product, and, which I'm sure you understand. So we're looking for margin. I think premium comes from margin, not from the, the maximum dollar. And so we're finding we've got margins right across the value chain. So um, I'll, I'll give you a wee practical example. Um, and, and at the moment, it's small, but it could become big, but it's probably the easiest way to describe it. So um, Fonterra has been trying for about seven years um, to crack the code for ambient UHT cream. So if you think about our big markets in China, you know, um, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, all of those sort of places, a lot of those people don't have refrigeration, don't have cooling mechanisms, and so we all know milk doesn't last long outside the fridge, we just take that for granted. Um, but of course there is a lot of demand for dairy nutrition in areas without refrigeration. So in the last 12 months, Fonterra has driven two things quite hard on farm, better cooling, in other words, from the, from the, the second the milk comes out of the cow to it gets in the vat, you've got to cool it fast to keep it down lower. And secondly is telemetry, so this is remote sensing, so that the, the ops in Hamilton can see what a milk vat temperature is in Invercargill or Canterbury or Masterton or the Waikato and say, we need the milk from that vat, that vat, and that vat to go to this factory to produce ambient UHT cream. And that in itself has cracked the code in the last two months, which now we've got a whole new product category. It's a luxury product, cream, but it can it's perfectly good for weeks on end sitting anywhere between half a degree and 40 degrees C. So that's the sort of innovation. So we're up in our research capability and because those are the areas where we're saying we're consumer centric um, and for some of those it's a luxury market and some of those it's actually just a damn good margin in a, in a, in a what I'd call a middle market. Chris, does that answer a little yeah, bit? Yeah, that's a, I mean there's a whole lot of yeah, other yeah, things but yeah, yeah. that's just one example. Yeah, yeah it's, it's actual products. Yeah.